Hello, I'm Phil Pan Baker, and welcome to part three of this demonstration of the mathematical mesh. In the first two parts, I showed the configuration of a mesh service and how Alice can use the mesh to secure her own personal data, even if nobody else ever uses the mesh. In this presentation, I want to show you how, to, how Alice can use the mesh to secure her interactions with Bob. Okay, so this is all about Alice and Bob. And so the first thing we're going to do in this demonstration is that Bob is going to gen generate a mesh account. So as before, an awful lot of crypto has happened under the covers, but Bob doesn't need to know any of that. As far as he's concerned, he just created himself an account. So the first thing that we need to do here is that Alice and Bob need to exchange their contact information. And again, we're going to use one. The mesh provides multiple mechanisms for exchanging contact information. And my favorite one is uh, near field communication, bumping phones or exchanging uh, wife, uh, QR codes at a, uh, you know, when they meet in person. But since it's uh, uh, a demonstration that is based on the line mode uh, browser, and since Maui is not going to have the QR code scanner code uh, for a few months yet, uh, we're going to use the uh, less uh, satisfactory mechanism for connection. So uh, Alice and Bob, when they start out, they both have a contact catalog that contains their own contact and nobody else's. How do contacts get in there? Well, they've got to exchange contacts. Now, so Alice, Bob is going to start the interaction by requesting a contact exchange with Alice. And Alice uh, reviews her messages from time to time, sees, oh, look, I've got a pending con connection uh, request from uh, Bob. So uh, let's just accept that. Again, this is something that uh, will be so much, so very easy to skin in a gooey sort of way, but okay, so we've accepted the contact exchange. And now let's just see what uh, contacts Alice has. Now Alice has her own contact and Bob's contact. And so now Bob, he's going to synchronize his account. And now he also has all his contacts as well as his own. So we've exchanged the, they both exchanged their uh, contact data. Um, depending upon how we did it, we can actually achieve a strong 120-bit uh, work factor for validating this exchange, but I won't go into how that's done here. I'll go into a separate series of uh, podcasts describing that part. But Alice knows Bob. Bob knows Alice. Uh, that's where we are. Okay. And they each know the trust anchor, the primary root of trust for the other person. Uh, see, when, when uh, Bob's uh, trust anchor is MAU3, whatever, and you see here that's entered into uh, Alice's contact entry for Bob. And these are strong identifiers that can be used to obtain strong updates for each other's contact information. What this means is that we've got the basis for automatically updating each other's contacts. So that if Alice decides to use Signal, she can put her Signal credentials into a contact and now Bob has her Signal credentials. Same for OpenPGP, SMIME, WhatsApp, whatever. Any end-to-end -end secure, uh, open end-to-end -end secure um, messaging or communications app that Alice decides to use, she can put contact information into her contact uh, and share it 
with all her users. And in fact, uh, the, um, the architecture, but not the current code, also provides for Alice to be able to, to um, provision one contact for Bob, Doug, and Carol, and her other close friends, and Mallet, well, he gets a different contact because, you know, Alice has had some bad experiences with Mallet over the years. Okay, so one of the things that we can do here is uh, we can do second factor authentication. So in the previous example, I showed you how the mesh provides an end-to-end -end secure password vault that allows Alice to access her passwords from any browser she might need them on, provided that it supports use of an open standards-based password vault. And if she can do that, well, she can now use passwords that are long and strong, you know, 20, 25 character passwords, not idly piddly little ones. And, but what I didn't mention was that in doing that, she's actually provisioned out a strong public authentication key to each one of those devices. So let's say Bob is Alice's stockbroker and Bob has a website. Well, Alice could actually authenticate to Bob's website uh, using her st strong public key authentication, using FIDO auth authenticate completely transparently. And so we could get rid of passwords altogether, right? Well, not quite. You see, it turns out that there's actually two uses for passwords in uh, web applications. One of them is to authenticate the user. And the other use is um, what is known as ceremony. When Alice is actually taking an affirmative step to say, yes, I really did want to do that. And so if we want to get away from using passwords, we need to uh, provide that second use of passwords as well. And the mesh does that uh, using what's called the confirmation protocol, uh, which similar function to those secure ID, uh, changing number tokens or oath, uh, click a button, changing number token, same idea, but revised. So Bob here is a Bob Alice's broker and his website has uh, received a request from Alice to buy uh, 300 shares in um, a stock called Ponzi. So uh, Bob is going to send Alice a message back to say, yeah, do you really want to do that? And so let's see, uh, buy Because, you know, this could be a really bad deal for Alice. In fact, yeah, it is. Uh, so Bob has sent that uh, request off to Alice and he can immediately uh, check to see the status of uh, that uh, request. Uh, and of course, it's pending because Alice hasn't done anything yet. And so Alice here, he, she is going to check her pending messages. Oh, I've got a confirmation request. Uh, do I really want to buy those 300 Ponzi shares? Well, yes, I do because, uh, yes, I'm actually the ringleader in the scheme. No, no, Alice couldn't do that, of course she could do that. But she's going to do it anyway. Okay, so yes, it really was me. Uh, and now Bob. Bob knows that uh, Alice has accepted. So we've got that single bit of information across uh, that Alice said to accept uh, this request. Only we've got a lot more because what we've got here is a complete digitally signed audit trail. Bob's, the mess. This interaction is using mesh messaging. Mesh messaging 
is an end-to-end -end secure messaging infrastructure. Every message without exception is signed and encrypted. They are limited, however, to 32 kilobytes. The payload is limited to 32 kilobytes. Uh, I'll explain why that's the case in a different in a different podcast. Um, so Alice, uh, it's not intended as a direct replacement for mail, but you could build a mail uh, messaging application on top of it. So the original request was signed by Bob, and Alice's response references that original request and is also signed by Alice. And so what Bob has here is actually an audit log of the fact that Alice's device, not necessarily Alice, you know, Alice could have been mugged. You know, there's still, there, there might still be some rebuttable doubt as to Alice really intending to do this. And depending upon the application, that might allow transactions to be unwound or not. But we do have a rebuttable uh, presumption that Alice did intend to, to do this. And that's actually a feature that you need if you want to get rid of passwords altogether. OK, so, so far with the mesh, I've given you free a password vault, a contact book for your cryptographic secure applications, a way to manage your SSH, and also a second factor authentication system. And this is all free, right? OK, uh, now let's get on to the important stuff. Uh, we, because I started off at the start, I said the mesh provides a mechanism to secure documents end to end. So how do we do that interaction between Bob and Alice? Well, Alice can encrypt a document for Bob in the same way that uh, she could for PGP or whatever. Just use the Meshman tool, same as, as before. Instead of encrypting it to uh, Alice at example.com, just encrypt it to Bob. They've exchanged the contact. You've got all the data that uh, they need to do that. And so now uh, Bob is going to decode. It works just like before. OK, so again, this is something that Alice and Bob could have done with PGP uh, back in the day. Uh, the only thing that's changed is that the mechanism for managing contacts has been drastically improved over the old PGP model. I won't get into how that uh, how that works in this presentation, but uh, I'll do a separate uh, uh, series uh, explaining that part of the model. But it's still a static encryption scheme. And so if Alice and Bob were workmates in the same team, this isn't really something that's going to work too well for them because, you know, in a standard team, well, teams are dynamic. So one day it's Alice and Bob uh, and Doug and Carol. And yes, we, Alice could at least in theory, the current tool doesn't support it. Uh, the code does, but not this tool. Uh, she could, in theory, encrypt the file for Alice and Bob and Doug and Carol all in one go. Yes, we could do that. But what happens then if Bob leaves the team and is replaced by Ingrid? You see, in an enterprise, teams are dynamic and new members of the team need to be able to access all the data of the team the day they start. You can't go around re-encrypting all those old files. So Alice is going to create a, uh, an encryption group and she's going to call it 
Group W. And she's going to provision the administration control of that group to all her devices with the web privilege. Now the group is just another mesh account. The only difference this time is that this is an account that is subordinate to Alice. And Alice can use that account to encrypt a document just like before. So instead of specifying um, Bob or Alice at example.com, it's now group W at example.com. And so now let's just decode that. And we can't. And the reason Alice can't decrypt that message is that she's only the administrator of the group. Being the administrator of the group doesn't necessarily give her the decryption rights. In order to grant the decryption rights for that group, she has to grant herself the decryption key. And so she's got to add herself to the group she created. So let's just do that. And now she can de And we can decrypt her again. But <clears throat> as you probably, as you might have noticed, when we decrypt this time, it causes an operation to occur at the server. So we're now using threshold decryption, which means that if Alice removes herself from the group, she won't be able to decrypt the documents again. Now, you might be asking, well, if Alice is the administrator, can't she just add herself to the group? Well, we might threshold share the administration capability between two or more people. So it might be that to join the group, you need to have your papers uh, checked by the administrator of the uh, office and then get yourself a, a key fob from the security group. Uh, you know, just because you are the administrator of a group doesn't necessarily mean that you should be read in to read all the information of the group that you are administrating, which is a lesson that the NSA probably wishes that they had learned before they made Ed Snowden the administrator of their key server. Okay, so in order to... So Alice can now, uh, so Alice now has a group and she can provide the decryption capability to, of that group to anybody she likes just by adding people to that group. And now all Bob needs to do is to synchronize his account. Get the document. And Bob can now decrypt. And that could have been any type of document. Could have been Word, could have been Excel, could have been PowerPoint file, could have been SolidWorks, could have been audio, could have been video, could have been inventor. Any document that is represented as a file on the computer is simply a sequence of ones and zeros that can be encrypted and shared with another user. And so now we've got the ability to not just encrypt data, but we can now share that data with all the members of the group. What happens if um, Bob leaves the group? Well, Alice just deletes him from the uh, group. So now notice that Bob's not going to synchronize his account or anything. but his ability to decrypt has been withdrawn. 
but Alice can add him back again. Bob's going to need to synchronize this time. And now his ability to decrypt has been restored. Now, one of the things about deleting, removing the ability to decrypt, however, is that as when we removed a threshold device from Alice's personal mesh, the device or the user loses the ability to decrypt, but still has access to the previously decrypted data. So here, so Bob can still read the decrypted data even after he's been decrypted. So even though Bob has been deleted from that uh, mesh group again, uh, he can't. He can still read the data that he decrypted earlier. And again, this is a reasonable trade-off between usability, practicality, and also possibility. I mean, if 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 Bob has decrypted data he's going to be able to do whatever he likes with it. And so if we want to have practical use of encryption in an enterprise setting, we've got to think of it as a tool for mitigating catastrophic failures rather than uh, as a tool for preventing any failure whatsoever. Notice how, since every time Bob attempts a decryption, the service has to uh, participate in that transaction, has to do the other half of the decryption operation. The service is an audit point and can also be a, th uh, a control point. So for example, in a more sophisticated setting, uh, there might be a throttle on the service that says Bob is allowed to uh, decrypt up to 100 documents in a day and 1,000 in a month. But if he um, tries to decrypt more than 10 in an hour, send a note to his supervisor. And if he goes over 50 a day, mark it really important. And so we can mitigate catastrophic failure of Bob decrypting 10,000, 20,000 diplomatic cables without impeding his ability to read one or two cables that he might need access to for his job. Again, it all comes down to what security are we trying to provide? Are we trying to absolutely prevent a failure or are we going to tr try to mitigate catastrophic failure? The mesh as currently uh, implemented, um, it's a standalone tool. Obviously to be usable in an enterprise uh, environment, it's going to have to be deep integrated into the application end users use, so Word, Excel, and so on. But that's not that difficult to do. Um, in order, if but if people were using it, it would certainly mean that instead of uh, breaches resulting in hundreds of thousands of users being exposed on a regular basis, maybe it would only be tens or dozens or hundreds and that's a valuable win. So in summary what I've shown you in these demonstrations is a, a small subset of the functionality of the mathematical mesh. The mesh is a threshold key infrastructure that controls all the cryptographic materials required to authenticate and encrypt data and to share that data between dynamically changing groups of users.
Thank you for watching. Thank you for giving me your time. Please like, please subscribe, and please consider giving some of your time to the Mathematical Mesh Project. We don't just need developers, we need people to try out the code and see if it meets real people's needs. Over the past 20 years, internet security has mostly got worse rather than better. It reminds me of the Lorax at the end where all the trees had been cut down and the what was once a paradise has been turned into a barren landscape. And the old Wansler says that things aren't going to improve unless somebody cares a lot. And a few years ago, I realized that maybe I had to be that person. Maybe I was the one who had to care. And I spent the past three years, mostly working alone, developing this code it's not going to take effect without a movement, without other people deciding that they care a lot and that they want to help change the web, change the internet for the better. The mesh might not be the final answer to internet insecurity, but I do think at the very least, it is a proof of concept that we can do much better than we're doing today. Thank you for watching.